All right, so we're starting to slow down. So I'm going to do the official welcome. So uh, welcome. This is a webinar for self care for people leaders, practical strategies to continue bringing your best. I actually had to read that because it's a very long title, but it does. It definitely says what today is about. So I'm Erica Hansen. I am honored to be your host and moderator of this amazing panel. I am from one of our partners. This is a partnership between Bravely and Blueboard. I am the coaching program lead at Bravely, also a coach on the platform. So when I heard that this was going to happen, I was incredibly relieved. <laughs> it might be an odd word to say, but in, in the coaching industry, all of you HR leaders, you, you need support. You, you need you need some self care and the opportunity we, we had a conversation a few days ago with the panelists and I just it was so refreshing the, the vulnerability that they're going to show you we ask you to, to join us in the chat, send some Q and a we will work them in. Um, but just to to start out, I want to actually just pass it to Allison who is going to introduce you a little bit to Blueboard and introduce herself and we'll take it from there. Sounds good. Hi everyone. So grateful to be sharing this space with all of you today. Just to echo everything that Erica said, um, I'm so happy that we're getting the opportunity to talk about self-care for um, this really important community. Um, I, uh, I've been uh, in the people space for a long time, many, many years now. Um, I've been part of a lot of really high growth companies across a lot of different industries from ad tech to fintech to HR tech. Um, and with that, I've experienced a lot of the challenges and also the excitement of scaling those teams and scaling cultures. Um, and I do know uh, through all of that how important self-care um, for yourself and for your teams is. So really looking forward to diving in. As Erica said, I'm currently the VP of People and Culture at a company called Blueboard, uh, where I have the privilege of leading our people strategy and people operations along with the fabulous Charlene here. Um, our people team touches everything from, or every aspect of our employee experience from you know, talent acquisition to HR and culture and um, a really important piece that has really been at the forefront of everyone's minds is also to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, for those of you who are maybe less familiar or don't know about Blueboard, we are an experiential rewards platform um, for companies who are really loved by their employees. Um, we know, or I, I definitely know firsthand, that organizations and people teams are tasked with the challenge of having to recognize and incentivize your employees. Um, ideally in really meaningful ways. And I think for a lot of teams, um, you know, gift cards or branded water, another branded water bottle is maybe not exciting you anymore. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, Blueboard is built on the belief that when people are able to connect with the world around them and tap into their personal passions and their creativity, um, they also get to connect with themselves and they come back to you as fuller and better versions of themselves at work. So our platform makes it easy for companies to give these once in a lifetime experiences to their employees. Um, um, and to really recognize them in meaningful ways. So um, we'll talk a little more about that later. If you're interested, we are happy to connect with you. But in the meantime, I'm going to hand it over to Charlene. Hi, everyone. I am Charlene. Like Allison said, I work on her amazing people team. I love the team that I work on. I love working at Blueboard helping people get out in the world, doing some blueboarding. Um, I work as the HR generalist here at Blueboard and I'm a bit more green in my career. I've been working in this space for about five years and I'm just really excited to be in this space with these amazing panelists talking about, um, yeah, mental health, you know, prioritizing HR needs. Um, yeah, really excited to be here. I'll pass it over to Tiffany. Hello, hello, everyone. I am Tiffany Richardson. I'm so excited. I'm thrilled to be here with you today. Uh, a little bit about me um, is that my background is specifically in uh, talent acquisition 
talent acquisition, education. And what really drew me to like the people talent acquisition space was I was really committed to wanting representation in our companies of all sorts from at all levels. And what I was often seeing was like the folks, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, looks like me were at the entry level roles. And I was like, well, I need to be a part of the team that's bringing the people in. And so that has, that was my initial driving factor. And as I continue to grow, I'm like, well, we have to figure out how people can be happy and satisfied at the companies. It's not enough to just like be there, right? Uh, and so I have really enjoyed my time and continue to enjoy my time in this space of people and culture and diversity, equity, and inclusion and talent acquisition uh, and continuing to grow in this space. And right, a part of what makes me so excited for this conversation today is that like it is amazing work that is challenging, right? And it's challenging at many different levels. And so when we think about this, this conversation today and self-care and, and supporting ourselves and putting our oxygen masks on first, like that's exactly what um, you know we need to do, right? And then I want to, to be a part of this conversation. So I'm really thrilled to be here. I am the director of uh, people and talent acquisition here at Bravely. And so Bravely, just a little bit more about the, the wonderful company um, that I'm with and what we're doing here, right? So Bravely is a platform that's connecting employees to professional coaching. And we're on a mission to make sure that like life at work is better for everyone. And the emphasis is truly on everyone. When you think about professional coaching and who has historically had access to, to that, it is executive leaders, right? And while that's wonderful, we truly believe in the power of, you know, equity and giving type, these types of resources to folks at all different levels, right? And usually when we're expanding this type of resource to folks at all different levels, people of many different intersectional identities and backgrounds have uh, access to resources that they have historically not. And so Bravely, we're the first coaching platform designed uh, to scale whole population support, um, you know, for companies of all sizes. And so I'm really thrilled to be here doing this amazing, you know, work with Bravely and making sure that as a company, right, like what we're telling other companies to do, we're able to live that for ourselves and for our people first. And so really thrilled to be here with you uh, and excited for our conversation today. And I'm going to give it back to Erica. I'm going to have to work this mute button today. <laughs> Thank you all very much. And yeah, I have to say, because I mentioned I was also a coach on the Bravely platform just this week. It was so fun. I had one, one of our client companies um, opened up Bravely to, to their interns. So I had like a fresh intern. And then my next session a couple hours later was with like a seasoned executive wanting some leadership executive coaching. And I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things though, that's out there as you all so are aware of and experience yourself and as you talk to your employees is this sense of this un, like underlying foundation of constant stress over the last two years. And it's not lessening as, as COVID dips in some countries, it, it's still constant in others, there's still peaks and more, then you add in wars and mass shootings. And um, in the United States, we had a huge Supreme Court ruling last Friday. All of these things that are happening, sometimes on a daily basis. And I want to really hone in on that. But but staying on the broader scale, I would scale. I would love to. And Allison, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to kick this off with you. But in this environment, as somebody whose your entire job is actually taking care of the people in your company, how do you prioritize your own needs? Yeah. I mean, Erica, you took the, you actually took the words right out of my mouth or out of my head. I, cause I've been thinking a lot about this question. It's been actually really nice to have some time to reflect on this. Um, and I think you hit it on the head. I think what has made this moment that we are in the last two to three years, it's, it's quite a moment. Um, so challenging is that it's not just one thing. It is the really sustained levels of intensity 
and anxiety that we've all been feeling for two to three years, which I don't think is natural. Um, and I think that it's really forced all of us, and I think especially people leaders, to live in this constant heightened state, right? And um, for me, that manifests and shows up like survival mode. Um, and without any kind of rest or real breaks, like you said, in these between these cycles, um, I know that when I'm in that state of mind, I instinctively, I think, compartmentalize um, and probably without even knowing that I'm doing it, I end up compartmentalizing and I immediately think about, okay, let me kind of remove myself and rem kind of detach from my own emotions. And I immediately go to what can I do for others? What can I be doing for the team, for the organization, right? And you just kind of run in, you, you go into operation mode almost. Um, and I think that as empaths, I think probably everyone on the call to some degree you would identify as an empath. Um, that's kind of the, as, as Tiffany said, that's the beauty and the joy and what we love about the work, but it is also what is really trying um, because it does mean that as we're holding space for others and as we are trying to find solutions, we absorb a lot. Um, and I know that I kind of had a real moment of reckoning with myself, um, you know, probably a year into the pandemic where I had to fully acknowledge how much I had absorbed and how much I had internalized and, and how it was impacting me personally. Um, on a, on a more personal level too, we were just talking before um, everyone joined and I also became a new mom right at the outset of the pandemic um, and now I'm expecting again. And so it's just been, uh, that's also an added challenge that I know a lot of caregivers who are also people, people, uh, you kind of have dual responsibilities or um, in all aspects of your life, you're thinking about how to care for people. And it can be really, really difficult to hold space for yourself and to show yourself the same kind of grace and kindness that I think we all really strive to offer to others. So um, yeah, we're going to get real folks. <laughs> Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, all of that. Thank you so much for sharing that, Allison. And, and I agree. I think that, right, like we are people, people. And so I think when in this type of environment, my natural incline is to say, how can I support people, right? Like the people they're coming and spending their time, right, uh, at work with us when they could, you know, potentially say, hey, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I, I need to disengage. And sometimes, right, like that's exactly what should be happening and, and, and I appreciate and I support that. And so for me, it's like, how can I show up for them to make sure that they have the safe space, the spaces where they can show up and be authentic, where they can be vulnerable, right? And so for to create that sometimes exactly it is going into operational mode, right? And I think that um, a part of what the challenge is, is being able to say to ourselves, well, first, I am, you know, I am a human being first, right? Like HR, human resources, I'm a resource, but I'm a, I'm a human um, as first, right? And it's not, I always say, it's not like uh, SHR. I'm not like superhuman resource, right? I'm just a, an individual doing what I can to support people. And I think the more opportunity I give myself to like have grace or to not have the answers and to not show up, it actually gives permission to other folks, right? To, to not have the answers in a neat space. And I often think about like, what does it mean to say, actually, I don't have the answer right now. Um, I'm going to take some space for me. And I you want to model that for people, right? And so it's very difficult because you want to be the resource. And sometimes the resource means being there and present and figuring out the opera, opera, operationalizing of things. And sometimes it means, hey, I'm actually going to model what it looks like for me to take self-care. And that might mean that I'm not able to show up in the way that uh, I would like to, right? Because I'm also, right, practicing what feels uh, natural to support, you know, my, myself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, speaking of being an empath and working operationally, I think sometimes so many things are coming your way throughout the day and it's 5 p.m. You blink and you realize that maybe I've had too many of these conversations for my capacity. Like maybe I passed my capacity 
five conversations ago, but I was in such operational, like I'm feeling for you mode. Like I really wanted to be there that I didn't check in and think maybe, maybe this conversation needs to wait for tomorrow, or maybe we need to put time on for Friday. Like maybe I need to go for a walk before I can have another one of these conversations. And as I was thinking about this question, I was realizing those times where I take that deep breath at the end of the day. And I think, oh, I think that was too much today. I think I took on too, too many of these topics today. And um, like you're saying, Tiffany, like remembering that you can not have the answer is so helpful, but we are always remember that, you know, it's sometimes that day we're going, we're in those meetings back to back and, and that deep breath at the end of the day, or that hug from your partner at the end of the day. And you're realizing like, oof. I didn't prioritize myself and, and my cup is empty and, you know, I need to fill up before I can be there for my employees again. How do you all do that? I, I, I mean, the, I love it. And I think, I think it was, it may have been Tiffany who in a previous conversation said, let's add the humanity back into HR. And, and that's what all three of you have really, have really already touched on. And that is, how do you, how do you do it? And in those moments, when the news hits, when you wake up to something else and you have to go and you have to lead a meeting or you have meetings, what, are there some self-care practices that you have learned or figured out or heard from somebody else? to really take care of yourself, not just in that moment, but Charlene, you mentioned you get to the end of the day and it, all of a sudden you're like, oh boy, <laughs> what do you do? I don't know who wants to, to pick that one up. Tiffany? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in first. Um, so I am an advocate for therapy. I think, uh, you know, if I'm having a good day, bad day, we have a weekly appointment and it's actually on my calendar and it says therapy, right? It's not private, it's public. And a part of me, I think, again, like a part of me practicing, it, you, know, you know, that for myself is modeling to all of our teammates. I'm actually every Tuesday at 3 p.m. to 4, I'm unavailable and I go to therapy. And that for me is a consistent space to be able to, digest what I'm experiencing in life. And I, you know, I don't, I, you know, I think therapy for many different groups of people could be something that could be something negative that's looked upon. But for me, it is uh, something that I champion. And that is like one of the, the main practices that I, I do take, right? Um, I think the other thing I would mention um, for, for myself is, is two other things. So like one, I, I take time off, right? And I think that like, making sure even if it's doing nothing. And I think especially working from home is really hard because you're like, yeah, I can sign on, I can jump in, I'm here, am I doing anything? And it's like, actually, I don't need to actually do anything. And doing nothing is doing something, right? Is rejuvenating. And so taking that time off uh, is really important. And I think the last thing is like having a community, right? And so I think that having a community of people who understand what it's like to be in HR. I think if you look on LinkedIn or TikTok, you know, we can, you know, it's a little, it's a little uh, you know, interesting. Uh, some of the posts, you know, and you're like, I'm doing the best that I can. And it's like, <laughs> HR is not great. And you're like, okay. Uh, so, you know, you're trying each day to do the best you can navigating what is a climate of different folks' experiences of what it means to, to have HR resources and support and not internalizing that. So having this community like we have today is special to me because I, you know, I know that you all understand the complexity of what, of what we're doing. And so those are like my three things um, for myself. I just want to say, I am already loving this conversation so much because I feel like Tiffany, I'm like, I'm, I'm putting that on a poster so I can see it every day. I'm like putting it on my, on my mirror so I can like state it back to myself. Like, yes, I'm a human and I'm a resource. And I mean, so many of the things I said, rest is productive. I mean, all of the things. Um, I think Tiffany, just to, to underscore that, I agree. I think that one of the challenges of working remotely, which all of us have had to do kind of abruptly in the last couple of years is it's been harder to set some of those boundaries. And um, I love what you said, like rest is productive. I think one thing, like very small habits, I think can have a really big impact on your mental health and on your well-being. Um, 
So I had, I was in a, in a bit of a rut where I realized I was spending eight hours a day locked in my office without ever going outside. And one of the benefits of working from home is that I could go sit on, you know, the patio, I could get some fresh air and I could give myself a little bit of a change of a scenery. And it's amazing just what something small like that will do. And 10, 15 minutes, what that will do for your energy levels. And um, when I realized that do practicing that habit actually made me a better version and made me more equipped and better able to support my team and everyone around me for, you know, that second half of the day. Um, I think that it really just helps to kind of reinforce that you need to, you need to prioritize yourself. The other thing I would say, uh, talking about community, Tiffany, is that I think I definitely am guilty of this in Zoom land, you know, I think you get onto a call and you immediately get to business, right? We've lost the interact, the human side of the interactions that were so lovely when you were in person and you ask about someone's weekend or just you see it, maybe they're feeling tired and you kind of check in with them. And I have reminded myself that it's okay if I spend half of the allotted time or maybe even the whole time of my one-on-one -on -one or of a meeting, just connecting with that person on some kind of personal level. We can, we can follow up, we can come back to the agenda item, but investing in those relationships in times um, when you're not in crisis are, I have found so, so important because it's that support system that you're going to need to help nourish you and sustain you in the really difficult moments. And I think a lot of that has gotten lost um, because we're just so go, go, go. You're probably in 10 Zooms back to back, um, but giving yourself permission to really invest in your personal relationships, I think especially for people, teams is, is so important because um, I'm sure some of you, you may be the only people person, right? Um, or the only person in your function. And so um, it's hard to find, maybe know who your peers are or to find that sense of community. So wherever you can build those relationships and have allies or people who can support you in return, I think is, is so worthwhile. Yeah, I feel like this is a group therapy session because we're talking about things that we can bounce back to ourselves. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we should take advantage of what we share with our employees, right? As um, HR teams, we're sharing our benefits package, our benefits overview, which might include therapy that we've never gone to before. I was guilty of that last year. And, you know, in a time where I was the only people person um, present at the company, my, uh, we were in between bosses, we were looking for Allison, and um, my counterpart was on vacation, like, I needed help. And asking for help, whether that be using the medical benefits that you offer your employees, <laughs> or asking a peer or a cross-functional person or a previous manager or um, a family member for help, I think is something that like I, I practice constantly is I need help. I can maybe do this alone if I push through, but I don't want to push through it alone. I want help. I want someone who knows what they're doing to help me, someone who doesn't know what they're doing to bounce ideas off of. And, and that might be speaking to a therapist so that I can, you know, I can just let it all out. Or that might be, you know, asking that cross-functional leader who has maybe more work experience than I do, like, hey, what do you think of this? Do you think that this is a good response? Um, how does this, you know, make you feel? Um, I need help on this project. Do you have time tomorrow to meet for 30 minutes to help me? Um, asking for help is, is it, it, you know, you don't have to carry all of it yourself or as an HR team, like you can, you can get help from, from anyone at the organization or outside of your organization. And um, yeah, I've found that holding myself accountable to that has made me be able to like show up better every day. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up, Sharon. And I just want to kind of interject and I, I, the chat is hopping. It's great. Keep it up folks. Um, I can't, I think it was HBR that did a spotlight on curiosity. I'm not sure how much, but um, how long ago, but there was a piece of it about 
asking questions and asking for help. And um, it was related to curiosity, but essentially it was, it was exactly what you're talking about, Charlene. And the study actually showed that people are actually viewed more positively and, and they actually garner more trust and vulnerability faster if you do ask for help and ask for questions. So I love that you brought up. Allison, you talked about filling up your cup when it's not empty. <laughs> <laughs> And, and that's like, talk, can you talk more about that? Because <laughs> I don't think that people remember what it's like to have your cup <laughs> filled. So how do you, how do you gauge and, and what does that exactly mean to you? And I'd love to love to hear the rest of the panel chime in on that as well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, two, I think two things jump out at me or come, come to mind immediately. I think one thing that I think as the three of us were talking and Tiffany, you said a couple of things is, you know, it's, it's self-care doesn't it, therapy investing in your, in your wellness is absolutely a component of that. I also think that you coupling that with some important behaviors and some important boundaries, um, is, is also really helpful. So I know we talked, I saw the chat, like everyone's been there where you're just going from zoom to zoom and, um, and it's, it's so draining. And, um, I think that even thinking about, can I set a day on my calendar where I don't have any meetings? That is a form of self-care because you are protecting your energy. Um, and just reminding yourself of that too. It's, um, it is, making sure that you're getting, you're moving your body and that you're checking in with yourself, but it's also really setting and practicing those boundaries um, in really kind of tactical ways too. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is like Tiffany said, take time off, take time off. And I encourage my team to do this. Um, please don't wait until you are at your limit or beyond your limit to take that time um, you know, take a day to just recharge before you're on complete fumes. Um, I, I think that is, is so important. I'm sure a lot of us probably encourage our teams to do that, but maybe don't practice it ourselves. Um, and so that's something that I think, um, uh, I think especially in, in the pandemic and in distributed work, you can kind of feel like, well, I'm not maybe going anywhere. I don't have any big grand plans, um, but it, and so you kind of think, oh, well, so I don't need to take a day off, but I think that um, just making space, do something on a Tuesday. Also take your time off in the middle of the week when you can do something that uh, will really pull you out of the the monotony of like, of the day-to-day, -day, I think can also be, um, uh, just really refreshing and re-energizing. Tiffany, can you talk a little bit about um, a recent change in policy that if people were talking about time off and PTO and unlimited versus days and mm -hmm. bravely just made a change recently in the PTO that <laughs> I had never heard of at a company before and um, I'm loving it. <laughs> yeah. So first is a huge shout out to our chief people officer, Katasha Harley. She's a wonderful. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, she has implemented for us is minimum, uh, you know, required days off. Right. And so we do offer unlimited PTO and we say 15, uh, you know, days a year unlimited, like you must take at least 15 days. Right. And so we can look at that quarterly. We can like, you know, map it out. You can take two weeks, however you want to do it, which, you know, invest service of you, but it's required, right? And so that means that if you're not taking time off, we're going to follow up to see what's going on. So that way you can take time off because we often do like, right? Like we, we either you have like 20 days or 15 days, whatever it is, but folks don't often take their PTO, right? And so I think we can always say like, well, what can we do as a culture to like shift the culture to make sure people know it is good for them to take time off, including ourselves, right? And I think requiring it even, you know, it, even if it's like we require, you know, one day a, a month, right? 12 days, whatever, or, uh, you know, 10 days, however you want to do it. That is something that truly, uh, I think, sends a message that like, this is something that we want to do and we're going to require. And it's like a positive, anyways, a positive, like reinforcement of like what we want 
to make space for, for, for folks, right? And so that's one of the shifts that we have made. And I, I wanted to mention something that like count that came up for me is that like um, Brene Brown once shared about doing research on like compassion, self-compassion. And she said that she found that the people who had like the most compassion were folks who had the strongest boundaries. And so that's, it goes back to Allison and filling up the cup is like, if I can hold boundaries and, and like say, this is what, you know, really works for me. And this is what I'm going to do, right? Because this is what I need to do to fill my cup. Now, uh, you know, when people come to me, I'm able to offer grace, right? Because I'm giving myself grace. I'm giving myself the space and time that I need for myself. And so I just wanted to share that because it really, you know, resonated with me because I was like, well, what, you know, like, what's the secret? And then she said boundaries. And I was like, oh my goodness. Like I was kind of irritated, irritated by it. I was like, okay, boundaries, here we go. Um, and then, you know, you know, also, you know, uh, I would also say like, for me, um, you know, like the death of urgency, I think that like in HR, right, like we can really think people, talent, you can really be like everything feels urgent and things, some things are truly urgent, but not everything is urgent, because if everything's urgent, then nothing's urgent, right? And so like, how can we let go of like, you know, unrealistic expectations around urgency that, you know, it's just truly not there, right? And I think sometimes that gets into having more difficult conversations with folks about like, this is what I can do when I can do it. Um, but, you know, those are some of the things. And I think the last thing I would add um, is like, make it micro, right? And so like, I like the things around like taking a walk um, in the middle of the day, the things around like, uh, you know, ending your meetings earlier, right? Like 45, 55 minutes instead of the full hour, it sends a message, right? And, you know, as well. Um, and so those are some of the things I have, of course, I'm really excited about this conversation. And then for the person who said, uh, they didn't feel like they had a community. I like am obsessed with like TikToks, And so forgive me, but like Dan from HR on TikTok, like, you know, like that's a, a person I love. I love the podcast work life with Adam Grant. I love like reading HR brew. And so those are just some resources that are just, you know, sometimes those are not exactly like one-on-one -on -one conversations, but it reinforces the, the community that you have. I love that TikTok. Charlene, how do you, you mentioned this before, how, is there, are there any practices that you found that work for you at the end of the day? Yeah, I would say going back to routine, I think, you know, we, we are people outside of work. And when we are at full capacity, I think a lot of things that slip first is our personal life. So making sure that you like I, my routine and my personal life for my mental health is after work, it's after I log off and I love to dance. Like I, it's a hobby. It's something that, you know, it doesn't involve any talking. You do not talk at all. Um, you know, we are not talking about our emotions. Maybe we're dancing them out, but I love ballroom dance. I love to partner dance. And this is something that like I let slip and have been bringing back into my life because you have the capacity to, to try new difficult things when you're, when you're good, when your cup is full and you can get into that routine of, okay, like Tiffany said, every Tuesday at 3 p.m., I'm in therapy, you know, yes, that part. And then also every Wednesday at 7 p.m. by myself, I'm going to a dance class and, you know, this is what I'm doing after work. So it can be something like that that's already in my routine that I'm holding myself accountable to going because I know it makes me feel better. Like, I, I don't want to go, I feel heavy, I feel rough, but I'm going to hold myself accountable or it's taking a deep breath at the end of the day, recognizing that I can't do it today, recognizing that it's too hard today. And, you know, maybe reading that book or laying in bed or crying on my partner's shoulder and letting myself do that and feel those emotions coming to work the next day, having my one-on-one -on -one with my manager, Allison, who's incredible at this and crying and saying, you know, I practicing those tools that we have, of I need help. I think I've reached my capacity and um, yeah, you know, making, reminding myself I'm a human, um, but the habits, the routine is a great reminder. I think, you know, having that regular therapy on your schedule, having that dance class for me, um, working outside and then, and then you have those tools in your kit of asking for help, leaning on your manager, leaning on your team, your family, like whoever you have to support you.
just wanted to really quickly double click on something that Tiffany said, because I think a lot of us have um, probably felt this in the last several years is that I think the environment and the constant cycle, which we talked about before, has made all everything feel urgent. Um, a lot of us are part of conversations in our businesses where you're trying to tackle really big existential questions about the actual business and the strategy. You're talking about the great resignation. And, um, and then we're also leaning into really difficult, really uncomfortable, but also really, really important conversations about diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, belonging. And um, I think that it feels really difficult to know where to start or you feel like you're not making enough progress on any of them. And I, um, fortunately, you know, Blueboard uh, gives us access to coaching as well. And so I was talking to my coach about this feeling of like, I just feel so spread so thin. And she reminded me that there is a difference between what is urgent and what's, and, and not everything that's urgent is important. Not everything that's important is urgent. And um, it's actually a, a pretty kind of like tried and true framework called the Eisenhower matrix. But having that kind of tool or that framework to put things kind of uh, like map things out and reprioritize was really helpful. Um, also, I'm kind of a visual person. So to see it visually um, did help me to kind of reground myself and to feel like, okay, I can get my arms around this again. Um, and I think that uh, checking in with, with yourself and going through an exercise like that can be really, really valuable just to kind of get you off of that hamster wheel. Yeah. I want to actually dive in a little bit more to what you've all been talking about. Um, I've been hearing how you can help kind of protect your own peace in your own burnout, but it's only to like some extent, right? So I, I guess it's a two-part question. <laughs> Probably not the best, but we're going to go with it. <laughs> Is how, what do you think the like the big challenges are out there right now that's causing specifically burnout in H in the HR people space and also taking those into considerations how do you how do you think that people teams need to be set up so that they are successful and that they are doing exactly what the three of you have been talking about. So I guess it kind of goes, goes hand in hand there. Yeah. I'm happy to jump in. I mean, I think that like, you know, the, the state of the world, right. As has been mentioned many times, right. Like that is definitely contributing, right. Like to the, the burnout and the challenges, uh, you know, that, that we're facing, um, right now. I think that the, rhetoric around not rhetoric but like the like great resonation right like the pressure so it, there's the pressure of who we are in in these spaces and how we need to you know show up and so i think all of that really um contributes directly to the the burnout of course that that we're feeling and when i think about the kind of like setup of hr teams i think that like you know we don't always right like get the like type of like staffing that allows for us to have capacity, right? For us to have the, the space that we need, right? And so I think a part of it is understanding like who are the leaders that we're working with and how they see people in HR, right? Is it, do they see it as more like compliance, right? And like mm -hmm. paperwork, the, or do they see it as like, hey, we're people leaders, we're here for the people. And that means that we, have, we need to model what this looks like first. And so if we don't wanna have our teams burned out, that means that we have to show that we have the proper kind of infrastructure to support our teams as they continue to grow. And so I think that means of figuring out, like, do you have the, the right, you know, resources around like HR kind of like human relations, right? Like the HRBP function, do you have the resources around like talent acquisition? You know, and if you don't, then are you going to provide the, the trainings or are you going to provide consultants for folks? So that way there's not one, you know, HR person who's like, I do talent acquisition, I do learning and development, and I'm here for all of the kind of like things that are up and coming. 
I think that that's too much for anybody. And so we need to be able to figure out like, okay, what really is feasible for us? And then how do we staff appropriately? And if we can't do that, then what are the things that we're saying are either going to have to be deprioritized? And often we, you know, I'll speak for myself. I can be a people pleaser and I want to say yes. And the actual answer is, no, or it's yes, and these are the things, right? Um, and so, and if, you know, so that's kind of my my answer, um, you know, an answer to that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, was, I was thinking the same thing, Tiffany. I think that now more than ever, people teams are being asked to wear many, many hats. I think that people teams have always had to wear a lot of different hats, but uh, we've thrown a bunch more onto that too. And um, I think getting really clear with your leadership team or with your executives about what is, um, what is reasonable, what is feasible. Um, a lot of other teams in your organization go through those same exercises. You look at a product roadmap, right? You look at what is in the pipeline or what isn't on target. And I don't think that people teams always get to go through that exercise and things just start piling up. So I love that idea of just saying, Let, let's, let's, have a, let's have a conversation about um, what gets prioritized, what maybe gets deprioritized given the resources that we have. And can I, can I jump in really quickly to add, like, one of the things that, like, is really important to me is, like, people, goals, objectives being a part of, like, the business goals and objectives, right? Like, do not come to me personally with, a you know, like, here is what's most important and, like, people and retention and culture is not on it. Because when we think about the cost for business, right, it costs to fill positions, it costs to replace folks to try to like, you know, backfill positions, right, especially of high performers. And so the highest priority, you know, is like, how do we retain our people, right, especially you go through all this work to get these amazing, talented people, diverse group of folks in the building, how do we retain them, right, that means to retain means resources, right, like we need resources to retain, and it can't just be my physical like presence, right. And so you know, I think that like, and especially when I think about like something like bravely coaching, right, especially when you think about employees feeling alone and isolated and providing bandwidth, a part of what I think the benefit of like what we offer here at Bravely is it gives like that HR team, that resource that now employees maybe perhaps aren't always just coming directly to HR because they are going to work this out with a coach and be able to take those next steps. And so I do think that there's just like, people and investing in people and your people and retaining your people has to be a primary like business objective all every year, all the always, right? And so like Allison is saying that roadmap and being able to say, what do we want to have? To, what are the deliverables for our people, for our people, culture and experience? And what are the resources we need um, to make that happen is, is super important because of the cost of, you know, not retaining of attrition of, of folks um, as well. I also just want to point out, I think one thing that, um, you know, I, I recently joined the team and Char so Charlene has actually been with uh, the organization for longer than I have. And I think one thing that Charlene has done such a wonderful job of doing is she's built such a wonderful working relationship and partnership with our other stakeholders in the business. So whether it's frontline managers, hiring managers, um, even leaders at all levels, all the way up to the C-suite, um, I think making sure that your leaders do understand that the people team is there to be a partner, an advisor, and a, a support, um, not just a service. Um, I think Patty McCord from Netflix said, human resources is you are a service, not a servant, which for me was like a light bulb moment when I heard it. Um, and I think that um, making sure that, I, Tiffany, you talked about the perception of people teams. I think that is also really important. Um, and so Charlene like has definitely done a great job of really kind of establishing that working dynamic. Um, and Charlene, I don't know if you want to expand on that. <laughs> I'm sure. Oh, thank you. And I think, you know, back to what Erica said about asking for help. Like, I think that those relationships really got established during a time where I, I asked for help and I leaned on them and I said and communicated to the organization when I couldn't, I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't do something and, and it had to happen maybe next week, or I had to wait until, um, I could get additional help to, to conquer that project. So it was 
it's a lot of, I think, transparency, like, yeah, having a roadmap, like you have a product roadmap, of course, and, and having your, your goals quarterly, and then also just communicating when um, you need the help, when you don't, when you unfortunately can't get to everything that at that time. Um, and yes, those relationships have absolutely um, helped. I'm, I'm lucky to have some really great colleagues as well. <laughs> How do you build those relationships in the sense of, well, sorry, you gave a great answer to that, <laughs> but in terms of, you all just talked about how to support your teams, how to support Charlene, you're touching and building those relationships, uh, but circling back to the very beginning of this, of this conversation, when it was about like, you're, you're human. And people are, no matter how good those relationships are, their people are going to start complaining and they're going to start to look at you at HR and say, you're to blame because I have nobody else to blame. So how do you reach into the non-HR space and communicate that you are human and you're not a punching bag? You're doing the best that you can do. You show up more than any other department. We probably can't say that, but as a non-HR person, I see that you do. How do you do that? How do you reach across? Yeah, I think, you know, I something that I feel very lucky or privileged to feel comfortable doing is being really vulnerable. Um, I think, you know, we all are more comfortable when people are vulnerable and practicing that, you know, we, um, the true vulnerability, when I am having an anxious day and my anxiety is high, I might take a breath in the middle of a meeting and say, sorry, I'm feeling really anxious right now. I think I need to take a breath or um, I'll look over, I'll get distracted by something and I'll say, I was, I was just really distracted. I'm thinking about a lot of things right now. Can we center again? So we have that trust. So when they, they are upset, your employees get upset when they're upset or maybe they disagree with something that, that uh, we did as a company or as a team, you know, they can come to us with that same vulnerability of, hey, Charlene, I'm disappointed in Blueboard right now this hurt me. And, and they can have that conversation with you and you can, you can, they trust that you're going to listen and that, or hopefully they trust that, you know, you'll be there for them. And I've had some of my most fruitful conversations with employees when maybe they didn't understand the full picture, you know, and maybe they didn't know. So they come to me because they know they can be vulnerable and they ask me, you know, why, why did we do this? Or can I give you some feedback on this? Because, you know, the world is on fire right now and I'm upset and I'm feeling fiery. Like, can I do a gut check with you? And we, that trust like that, that we are both vulnerable with each other is I think what helps get through those moments and get the, that honest feedback that we want out of maybe those pulse surveys that don't always give us honest feedback or whatever it is. Like we're getting that raw feedback from our employees because we've been raw to them. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think that the vulnerability is so important, but you know, for, for me, sometimes, you know, I can, you know, take things a little personal. So sometimes for me is I, I need to log off and, you know, take a walk, take a beat, talk to my <laughs> partner, talk to a coach, talk to a therapist, get all of like my first kind of like set, you know, kind of like not so HR, HR responses. Uh, okay. And then recognize, right. The humanity in myself and the humanity to others, right. The same way that, uh, you know, that uh, they have a right to their feelings, so do I, right? And so a part of that is like, everyone has a right to their experiences, their feelings, their journey, right? And, and to refocus on like, well, what's my, like, what's my, what's my goal here, right? And so that like vulnerability is definitely key, taking the time to reconnect, recenter for myself, because I'm a human being, um, you know, as well is definitely uh, important, right? And I think that like, when you, uh, if you, potentially like overexert yourself, give so much, right? When someone's like, hey, I have some valid feedback, right? Some valid thoughts, some here's where I think you all need to do even more. You know, if you're taking that time for yourself, you're able to receive that, I think. But if you're not, you're like, do you know I was just online <laughs> writing this and doing that and checking this and, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm trying to make it all, you know, right? But like the reality is, is like, actually, 
I'm not going to be online. I'm going to take the time for myself. And therefore now I can receive it and take that action and not take it personal and just take it as a part of like the experience of some way of like customer like service, right? Like the, the, the resources and service part um, of, this, of this role. Yeah. I mean, I, I would echo everything that all of you, both of you just said. I think it's so important for our, our employees to see your people teams and also your leaders. I think it starts at the top, um, you know, see us as human beings. And I think oftentimes, especially I think in HR, I think we get, um, we get cast with this, uh, this expectation that we have all of the answers. We have fully, you know, perfect solutions to everything. I think some of that, you know, we probably put some of that pressure on ourselves, but I think, yeah, it's absolutely okay to say, I don't have the answer right now. And actually I need to take a minute. I need to take it, take some time for myself. I will get back to you. Um, and Tiffany, I love, uh, being able to turn off and come back to it. I think it's, uh, I, I do have to constantly remind myself, it's okay if you don't get to it tonight, it will be there in the morning. It will still be there. Um, and you can come back to it probably when you're in a better headspace. And like a, a tangible thing is like an icebreaker, right? Like a, like a you know, this icebreaker where it's like, what are, how are you showing up today? Yellow, red, uh, green, or like, what are two words to describe how you feel in a day, right? And so even if we were to be in meetings that are cross-functional and sharing about our own experience or how we're feeling, maybe I'm feeling red or maybe I'm feeling yellow or maybe I'm feeling green, yeah. whatever it is, like those type of conversations and participating in that, I think helps like deposition us as just being like, you know, the people team, right? Like mm -hmm. people who are in the people team. Yeah, we learn from people too. I mean, I've learned to be vulnerable. A previous uh, person on a team in a different company one time said, uh, was so vulnerable. She, she was my manager and she said, um, she was distracted and she said, I'm sorry, I'm not feeling really well right now. I have new antidepressants that I'm taking and they're not sitting well with me. Like that was, I mean, we're not all comfortable being that vulnerable, but when she said that in a meeting, it, it reminded me that my boss was human and going through something and going through something very human and relatable. And, you know, that set kind of like the tone for me and getting, you know, more comfortable at work, more comfortable being vulnerable. Um, but yes, I, you know, I'm a red today. I'm, you know, I'm experiencing something difficult today and not always just saying, oh, I'm a yellow or, oh, I'm a green, you know. I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Mute. Um, even though I'm wearing red, I'm not red. I am all green right now because this has been an all heart conversation. And I know that everybody in the chat who's been participating knows that not just the humanity, you have it in HR, but you, you bring the heart. And we're going to do a quick, quick closing round robin. And Lauren, and I'm sorry, you if, if you all keep seeing me go like this, I have new contacts in and I don't think they're working very well. So I think it's Lauren who said this, but um, some people are still in organizations where they're not just, they're not there yet. And so if we can, and Tiffany, I'm gonna start with you and do just a quick closing round robin. What is one step, one takeaway that companies could do and individuals could do to help? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that with Lauren's question, I think one, it's difficult, right? To have folks who are like, it's 2022, let's go. Right. And they're like, no, I think that like, I look at working with folks in this way in two, in two ways. I think about a moral argument, right. And I think about the business, the business outcomes. And so I'm always framing and, and trying to figure out, right. Like one, do I have any champions who I can connect with who will help bring other, everyone else along, but then I figure out what are their motivators. If they're talking about like business outcomes, there's a ton of research, research and, and data around like retention and attrition and embracing, right? Like generation Z and millennials and like, you know, all of that, like bringing everybody together and what we need to do to create workspaces that work for everyone. And so I would look at like, kind of like the data that shows kind of the business outcomes. And if we are able to do certain things that will help us get to the ultimate business outcomes that we have, right? But then there's the moral argument of like people and taking care of people and, and using that. And so I would figure out like, 
what are people motivated by if they're not exactly coming with just kind of like the we need to do this naturally and then start from one of those two angles. Um, and I think if there's anything to, to take out of this session that I would share is like, one is that like, I see you and I think we all see each other as HR leaders and recognize the complicated and tough and the beautiful work that we all do. And, and that, the, you know, like filling your cup and prioritizing and putting your oxygen mask on first is always gonna be the, the, the first priority. And I think there's many ways to do that and figuring out one simple micro thing that you can do um, is, is the first step. Thank you. Okay. Charlene, what about you? Yes, I would say, you know, if you can, if you have control over it, or if you have uh, the, the voice to do it, making therapy accessible for your employees and yourself is, so helpful it's so valuable we have a program at blue board where our employees receive free therapy and we can use this ourselves we can recommend it for our, our employees we can um, hold ourselves accountable to using it and really taking that for yourself like that's that's intentional time for yourself um, you know if you if you can push for initiative like that at your company i would really encourage you to because yeah they're very um they're very helpful and then I know you said one thing but just piggybacking off of what we've all been talking about having a network at blue board we even have a group called Jedi it's called justice equity diversity and inclusion and this group we can be really vulnerable with and ask for help from employees it's an employee driven group and um really get honest feedback from that group um twice a month. So yeah, whatever you have, I guess, access to um, lean on that. Yeah. Um, and just to kind of bring us home uh, uh, on, I think it was Lauren's question um, and to build off of what Tiffany shared around what motivates, you know, kind of meeting people where they are, learning what language is gonna resonate with them. I also think a really valuable thing in your tool is, Think about your values. Think about your company values. If you can align on your company values, most leaders and most organizations do not want to appear inconsistent with your values. So if what you're proposing or what uh, whatever initiatives you're working on, if you can tie them back to your values, um, it can, I think, be a really great entry point to those conversations to help gain some buy-in. And just on a more personal note, I mean, to echo, yeah, everything that we've talked about here today, um, I would encourage all of all of us here to stop some, I, I can't take credit for this, but stop shooting on ourselves. I think about how many times a day we ask, I should, or say, I should have done this. Um, and, or, or we also ask the question, am I doing enough? And please walk away from today knowing that you are doing enough, you are enough, and um, we, I, all of us here definitely see you and um, commend you for the work that you're doing because it is difficult. It is challenging. These times are challenging um, and we are all doing the best that we can and we're doing really important work in supporting our people. So I'm grateful for everyone in this community. Thank you. And Georgia, if we can put the SHRM code up. <laughs>